Hi, this is Gene Bosler. I'm in Katy, Texas. And I'm going to take a quick look at this property. This is for the client, but it's also for the world to see. Okay, the first item of concern is this live oak here, planted in this front yard. Nicely shaped tree. Uh, this lean, maybe because of Hurricane Ike, which has been three years ago. Uh, next week, it'll be three years since Hurricane Ike. Or it just leaning because it's root bound. So mulch is good, and if you just look at it, you know, compare it to the next door neighbor, that's a real mound. This is relatively flat. It doesn't look like a volcano mulch mound, as uh, is commonly called, but it is sticking out of the ground like a telephone pole, so its root collar is buried. Now I did a little cursory examination just to demonstrate how badly it's buried, and I found a knob here Looks like a girdling root died off or some other knob. And there's a little bit of a flare here, but on this side there's nothing. So there's a lot of roots here growing on the horizontal plane, which is higher than is natural for the soil. So the tree is root bound, which doesn't surprise me that it, that it blew over a little bit. Ton of fire ants too here, by the way. And you can see this is really, you know, this outer bark has already begun to rot. So that needs to be exposed. It needs to be. It's not the sort of task you put your your gardener to, because every little nick is an infection point, an invitation to a wood rotting pathogen, which you can be sure is ubiquitous in the soil. So girdling roots expose the root collar, and uh, generally recondition the soil through here. Uh, is, is I was only able to stick my probe in the ground you know this far which is like six inches so I had about three quarters of an inch of topsoil here and then a pretty stark transition to this construction backfill which is clay you can see that I'm right up against the tree here um, one two two and a half feet from the trunk and I didn't find any roots. So it's definitely a root bound tree. It definitely needs to have a root invigoration procedure done to it. Wherein we, you know, would probably remove the, f the grass out about another two to three radial feet and want to use an air spade or air excavation tool to aerate, cultivate, decompact this whole entire area, incorporate compost um, and other soil amendments like sulfur. I'm going to do a soil analysis here as part of it so that we're being more or less exact about the amendments that we use when we're trying to increase the cubic footage of soil volume for this tree to accommodate it in maturity. There's plenty of room here. It's a nice big yard and I'm pleased as punch to see that they didn't pack three or four trees in here. So this is a perfectly suitable tree. I think that a live oak is better suited for a one-story house than it is for a two-story house because their habitual tendency is to be wider than they are tall. Now that one isn't but as they reach maturity they tend to be wider than they are tall and so they're always slamming up against the house. This is a really well situated tree Unfortunately, it's got a little bit of a lean, but that's manageable. And I think that if we increase the diameter of the bed as the tree grows, we're going to have a super healthy, low-maintenance tree in the future. Unfortunately, it's too late to correct every single little problem, but we can do some subordinating of codominant stems is the terms that we use. But what we're really trying to do is train it to behave like an adult and continue vertical growth and uh, be a good uh, shade producing tree in the future and so there's some pruning that we can do to that. The next thing I found, I'm not going to address your dead spots in the lawn. You'll already have uh, learned from my my uh, narrative so far that you know I'm, I'm trying to e decrease the amount of lawn you've got by making your bed bigger. And so you've got some dead spots in your lawn 
maybe get a lawn guy but ask a lot of questions and make sure he's not using a weed and feed or anything that contains a herbicide and, and you should consider your entire front yard to be the root zone of this live oak and you don't want any herbicides to, get, to grow in there so this is a clay era it's got a really bad leaf miner infestation but it is isolated here and I want to show other li other watchers and m many folks who are actually professionals in the industry what this looks like it's very distorted leaf when you have a leaf distortion it usually means that the leaf is being attacked when it's young and as it continues to grow it becomes distorted this is a pretty classic distortion right here so on the you get a boomerang kind of growth pattern as the distortion happens on one side in this particular case it looks to me like a leaf miner I'm not sure but uh, you know I've seen plant hoppers on here so this is very isolated so and on the one hand I think it would be nice in theory to be able to prune it out but that might not might need to be addressed this is a Burford Holly and it has one of the severest uh, scale infestations I've seen in quite some time. Let me see if I can find an example. Oh yeah, so here's a good, good one here. This is on the upside of the leaf. Now this leaf I plucked for the co customer and I'm leaving it here on the front porch. Look at that. Look how heavily infested. That's the underside of the leaf. That's usually where we find it. So it's so bad that it's migrated to the top side of the leaf. So what you're going to happen is, you know, you've already seen this, where the shrub is dying, and the lower one third has almost no foliage at all. Look at this. So it's a, it's wider at the top and narrower at the bottom, and that's just a, you know, anybody anybody who wants to can buy a hedge trimmer. There's one in use right down the street at Lowe's or Home Depot, but that doesn't mean they know how to use it. And I don't want to be, you know, hypercritical. But if you want a healthy Burford holly, or any other shrub for that matter, it should be a trapezoid. So it's a little narrower at the top and a little wider at the bottom. You have better light penetration and you have less incidence of the lower one third of the plant completely dying off from lack of light. And that's also where the scale is, in, is concentrated. You probably also have pop-up heads here. So you're watering the lower portion of it, helping that to die out. So this whole thing should be a a soaker hose bed and and well I do see a soaker hose so maybe you've already made the transition so that's good we just need to address some of this other stuff there is more of this leaf curl here um, crepe myrtle needs to be pruned off the house there is some some uh, moisture stress here on the leaves that's not bacterial leaf scorch although this is a susceptible plant this does not look like bacterial leaf scorch this looks like heat and moisture stress I don't see any powdery mildew. I do see some, you know, you know, some other kind of problems. What's causing this right here? I'm not sure. But there is some similar distortion. That could be an aerified mite. This is springtime caterpillar right here. This is springtime caterpillar right here. So there's a chewing insect, but this would not be the time of year to treat. You can treat organically with that. And of course, we, you know, when it comes to to pests that damage our trees and our foliage we, we don't want to use the nuclear we don't want to use weapons of mass destruction so to speak we want to t target the pest and leave the the non-pest insect populations intact uh, I don't have enough battery power to go to the back but I am going to give you some recommendations for the front and I'm going to go and see if the uh, if the back gate is locked or not thank you very much and of course email me with any questions uh, info at wideworldoftrees.com. Thank you.